Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, or Aquaman 2, review and thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you, this was a movie that I honestly loved. I wasn't quite expecting to, but yeah, I, yeah. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I started the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. If I decide over the course of the video that I will, I'm going to verbally warn and hold up an index finger until I'm done spoiling so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. I will not be warning before spoilers for earlier entries in the DCEU, and as soon as I end the video itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So this movie is PG-13, and the IMDb Parents Guide, let's see, yeah, um, sex and nudity is none, violence of course, moderate, profanity is mild, alcohol, drugs, and smoking, is none and frightening and intense scene scenes are moderate and let's see the yes um I watched this movie once and I record this right after getting back from the movie theater and I Yeah, this is a, a perfectly fine place to talk about. The 3D was was fine. Honestly, I remember the 3D for the first movie being better. I totally understand why they pushed this back by a year so that they wouldn't lose a lot of viewership to Avatar 2 because the 3D there is much, much better. There was definitely there were there were times where there was clear depth. Uh, there was at least once where something like flew at the camera, but yeah, it you know if you're making the decision, you don't have to watch it in, in 3D. And it's yeah, it's rare for me to to like I I love good 3D. Now, the, let's see, yeah, so this was written by, okay, oh, that's right, yeah, okay, so the screenplay is by David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, which is apparently all one person, okay. Thought briefly it might be two, but no, that's all one person. The story was written by James Wan, along with David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, Jason Momoa, and Thomas Pa Sibbett. I am not familiar with that last one or with David Leslie. Um, right, uh, David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick also wrote Wrath of the Titans, the first Aquaman, the screenplay for the first Orphan, and the story for the sequel. Also wrote some of the Conjuring movies. So, yeah, has worked with James Wan elsewhere. And... Yeah, um, and the movie is directed by James Wan, like the first one also was, and yeah, I, at some point I'm going to have to watch more, like I don't, I don't even know if like The Conjuring, I've heard some, some good, some bad, I, I'm very... I'm not always into to supernatural horror, but he really impresses me with these two Aquaman movies. He did a good job on, on the first Saw. I don't blame him for what I hear 
end up being a fairly messy and mixed bag of a of a franchise. Now, it it is you know, it is very much the case that you can tell that this is a James Wan directed movie. He has a very clear like it's it's really too bad. Honestly, James Wan's Aquaman vision is one of the things I'm gonna miss the most about the DCEU now that it is dead. And yeah, um like he really embraces the the whole like just yeah um this thing of it's a comic book so you know just any idea if there's some sort of like if it if it feels in some way relevant to the subject you yes you can do it especially now you know that these movies cost like 200 million and all this CGI that you know so so yeah if it more or less makes sense as something that would be in this water you know underwater society stuff yeah let's you know let's do it and just he he is not afraid of making a comic book movie he's afraid of not making a comic book movie if he's setting out to do a comic book movie and I seriously respect that so that's yeah, really gonna miss his vision. So let's see. Yeah, so so yeah, ranking all the DCEU movies worst to best, and yeah, the ones I love start with Shazam two. So yeah, Batman v Superman, Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four, Snyder Cut twenty sixteen, Suicide Squad twenty seventeen, Justice League, Man of Steel, Black Adam, Shazam two, The Flash, Blue Beetle, Wonder Woman one, Aquaman, Shazam one, Birds of Prey and the 2021 Suicide Squad. And I will update this list with the, yeah, my ranking of Aquaman 2 at the end of the review itself before I get into spoilers. And, yeah, um, the, I think the DCU is at its best when it focuses on on standalone instead of franchise building. When a director with a compelling vision is at the helm, especially when they're allowed an R rating and a lot of creative freedom. By far, some of the best are Birds of Prey, Joker, and The Suicide Squad. And let's see. right, and yeah, I am aware Joker is technically not part of the DCU continuity, but it is a recently made DC comic book adaptation film that's why I include it and yeah uh, this one is is another one of you know just like it's very standalone um, you could watch this and basically pretend like there is no DCEU there's just two Aquaman movies and nothing else that connects to you know like the, f the first one has like at least one line about the events of, of the f theatrical God of Justice League, but the, I suppose it could be either cut of Justice League, but yeah, this one, not really, you know, it's, it's really only concerned with the, the Aquaman aspect of, and yeah, um, I really think that's, it, it makes it much more, you know, I'm not, like, it's not the biggest problem with The Flash, but one of, yeah, The Flash movie is barely a Flash movie. Now, let's see, yeah, so, in the first film, in, in the first Aquaman, Aquaman himself is by far the least interesting aspect, because as talented and charismatic as Jason Momoa is, as hard as he works to make the character appealing, it's just not a very interesting character. You know, so far he hasn't been in the DCU at all. It's just so try-hard and bland. Like, they were terrified that people would make jokes about the character, so they tried to make him so cool that no one would be able to, you know, make fun of him. And went way overboard. Like, he's this biker, wrestler, heavy metal dude, constantly whooping and going, Yeah, my man. You know, the rest of the movie in Aquaman 1 does make up for this deficiency, and honestly, I liked his character better this time around. I think 
the fact that, yeah, you know, this time around, following the events of the first movie, he's the king of Atlantis, and that is not something that he was really, he's also, you know, he's also a father, you know, these are not really things that come to him easy, and something I really appreciate about this movie is it's not just one of those obnoxious Hollywood movies that are like, you have responsibilities, you don't like it, well, toughen up, be responsible, because those are so boring, like, we get it. If you have responsibilities, you should be responsible. It's not that Arthur does not care. He just feels like he might not be able to live up to it, you know, and he's, yeah, he's struggling with the balance, which, you know, yeah. It's, you know, sit, sit down with Spider-Man, you two work that out. So the, the, yeah, they made him interesting. They made him interesting by forcing him to grow up a little bit and, let's see, yeah, I, I have to admit, I don't know much else that Patrick Wilson has been in, but, you know, the, it's, yeah, so he plays Orm in these two movies, he plays Night Owl in Watchmen, the dude just somehow manages to make it look natural that he's wearing, you know, he's wearing these ridiculous comic book costumes, he's reciting the kind of dialogue that only appears in comic books, I love to see it, I hope that he gets to keep doing, you know, so, so, yeah, with, with this one, you know, he's not, he's certainly not going to be playing the same role, if I understand correctly, some actors will be in the DCU who were in the DCEU, but they won't be playing the same roles, just, he's, he's so good in, in these, like, it is, like, if you haven't rewatched the first Aquaman in a while, like, you know, treat yourself, it's, it really holds up, and it just, yeah, the, this dialogue that he has to deliver, that is just, you know, the, and, and he absolutely sells it, he does in this movie as well, and, yeah, well, you know, when I watched the, the first one, I was hoping that they would bring back the character for, for example, a team-up. He's too interesting to do away with. I was always really happy that they didn't kill him off at the end of the first movie. And, yeah, they they did a good job here. You know, it's, it's this Thor-Loki kind of thing that they've got going, you know. the And in some ways, this movie is like Thor 2, which, you know... Fans of Thor 2 rejoice, both of you. Let's see. And... Yeah, I, I really think they did a good job with the, the character in, in this film. Like, I will grant that I don't love how much of a punchline he becomes in this movie, but this is one of those movies... Like, we've seen it a bunch with recent comic book movies. Kind of everything's a punchline. Like, they don't take very much seriously. Now, I will say, a lot of it made me laugh. I laughed at least half the time. Maybe even, like, two-thirds of the time. That last chunk where we, didn't, where we don't really laugh. Some of that's kind of rough. And... Yeah, so yeah, Aquaman 1 is one of the too few comic book movie adaptations where the camera actually is as free and fluid as it is in many comic books. There is some of that here. I, I definitely did like the camera work a lot in this. I thought it was sometimes quite dynamic. It's not quite up to the standard of the, of the first. So... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so Shazam 2 does not follow up on the interesting situation the antagonist is left in by the end of the first movie, but yeah, this one does. 
so yeah, the the first movie over the course of it shows us what the seven lands of Atlantis are like, and the um, yeah, this one also has a lot of stuff in parts dif different parts of Atlantis, and uh, yeah, like the first one does not leave Atlantis all that much. And, yeah, so I love Black Manta in the first movie. Really, really happy he's back. They, uh, I don't love everything they do with this character here. I don't think that Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, if he's ever done something wrong, then I don't know it. Um, he's one of the few bright lights in Matrix Resurrections. He's amazing in Candyman, Us, this, uh, the first Aquaman, like just, I'm so glad he's acting. He's, he's so, so good. I didn't think the character was quite as compelling here as he was in the first one, and I really hate to say that because I really that was something I was really, really looking forward to. There's a there's a thing that uh, goes and and there's a yeah there's an aspect to his character in this movie. Others have already mentioned. Uh, I'm going to be linking in the in the description box. Um, hold on, his. I'm going to get his name right. Zach Milne Talks Movies also, you know, talks about this a little. And just, yeah, it was not it was not necessary. Like, the character, we already had this thing of, like, this is a really intense, destructive character. It's, yeah. Um, I do understand why they did it, in part, the, f the first movie features two major antagonists. Both of them are back here, and Orm, there's not a huge difference... So if they didn't change anything major about Black Manta, yeah, it would be like, why are we going back to theaters? Why are we paying 3D prices if there's not something hugely different? So, so they felt they had to change something. I wish they had found a way to... Because to... I do think it could have been... You you could have had it not be quite as yeah, but uh, let's see yeah. So I won't give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before, and I like the way that the movie ends. I I don't know that I love it, but I did think that it made a lot of sense for yeah. The movie has one post credit scene or a mid credit scene. You don't have to, like, you know, some people might really like it. It's it's not, like, important. Well, yeah, obviously it won't be since there's no more DCEU, but it was never meant to be important. And the, yeah, so the... The acting definitely has some some issues. Um, I'm not the first to point out Nicole Kidman does not feel like she really wants to to be there, and it's it's too bad. Um, I I maintain that she gave quite a strong performance in the first Aquaman. You know, it's not this thing of oh you know after so and so many years. You know, she is still capable of of acting. I I can imagine she maybe just didn't really love the script. Like for for sure, like 
she's not given a huge amount of really compelling material. You know, the the it's not nothing. There are she gets to say several lines that are like yeah, re really good really really meaningful and and stuff that her character that feel in character for her and and such but yeah um i liked john reese davies i would have liked him to have more more of a presence i did quite like dolph lundgren you know he's one of those actors like dolph lundgren like schwarzenegger stallone yes even van damme under the right circumstances, they can act. I don't know if these were the right circumstances, but dude really tries. He's 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 really trying to to sell, you know. And he has more lines than you might think, which appears to be because at least some of them were supposed to have been Mira's lines, Amber Heard. She is still in the movie. She's not just there for like half a second like the trailer had her. I I will just briefly say if you look at everything that we found out it is very clear that the the marriage between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp was mutually abusive. Both of them were abusive towards the other. I'm not saying that she deserves complete forgiveness. I'm just saying Johnny Depp definitely doesn't. And that's, I've seen way too many people, you know, rush to, to defend him. Like, it wasn't even new when we heard it from Amber Heard. We had, we already knew that, that he had some, some traits. It's just people really liked the characters he plays and that makes sense you know he's played characters that are very charismatic he can be very charismatic when you ignore the the awful stuff he's done in his personal life i i think they they did about as much as they could to remove her from the movie like i i've seen some people say oh they should have just removed her completely I would love for you to to explain how they're supposed to remove like there are some scenes where you just you cannot remove her from it's it's completely absurd to she she's going to be there so what they did was just cut her her dialogue anything that didn't need to be said by her was either not said or said by someone else um Right, so yeah, I've mentioned that Jason, that, that, yeah, Arthur is a more interesting character, does of course beg the question, does Jason Momoa rise to the challenge? I absolutely think he did. I, I know some people say that he can act, I disagree with those people. Randall Park was quite fun, you, you know, Dr. Stephen Shin, you may not remember him from the first movie. You may be wondering why I'm bringing up the actor known for playing Jimmy Woo in the MCU. He has helped Black Manta. You know, we, we he does not have a lot of screen time in the first movie. But he helps Manta and they agree that they're going to, you know, Manta suggests, you know, that he's willing to help Shin find Atlantis, which Shin is convinced exists, but has yet to find the location of, you know, find definitive proof of Black Manta has been there. Black Manta is willing to help Shin, provided Shin help him kill Arthur. And Shin, like, from the start of this movie, he's that comic book character. He's the, the henchman who's in too deep, and he, you know, he knows it, but he's just, you know, yeah, he's trying to grapple with the, the gravity of the situation. You know, one of, literally one of the first lines that the character has, he records these audio logs, you know, as a scientist, and he's like, so, I better deliver what Black Manta is asking for, 
Because if I don't, he is going to... It's probably best I don't think about it. You know, it's, there's a... Yeah, it's a it's a fun dynamic. This, you know, this mild-mannered, you know, scientist versus this, you know, massive guy who's, you know... He can snap you in half like a, a toothpick with a with a you know tiny little adjustment of his of his pinky finger, and yeah, you you are terrified of disappointing him. Temuera Morrison uh, returns as as Tom Arthur's father. He's still great. He doesn't have a huge amount of of screen time. I do appreciate that they did make sure to give him something to to do. And on at least one occasion, there is this, as, as far as I've been able to tell, Maori um, cultural, like, like a, a ritual that, that Tom and Arthur carry out. So, you know, inspired by Temuera's, I've, I actually don't know for sure if it's also, let's see, is Jason... Manoa Maori. Um, hmm. Let's see. Samoan and Hawaii Polynesian. Okay. I'm not really seeing. Okay. Um,. But the, um, let's see, yeah, um, Martin Short is in this. I'm I'm glad he's still acting. Like he's he's great in this. He's he's still, you know, very very entertaining. I I honestly, I would not have guessed. Like I remember some of his eighty stuff. I I'm, yeah, surprised that he is still. But, yeah, positively so. And I'm going to see if I can pronounce this correctly. So, the... I guess it is... Um... Yeah, it doesn't say how. Okay, Johnny Zhao plays Stingray, and she's basically the the second in command, the right hand of Black Manta. I kept hoping she would get something really deeply compelling to say or do, and and sadly, ultimately, I don't think they ever really got there. I think she has uh, quite strong presence and intensity. Like she, you know, one of the, an important thing for a character like that is for the actor or actress to project this is someone you don't want to screw with. And yeah, she got that across very nicely. I like to see her in, in other stuff. I really, it feels to me like it's just the material that failed her. She's been in a bunch of stuff. She's got twenty seven. Prior credits in total and two upcoming. And and she's only from 1992. Holy crap. She's been acting since 2007, so age 15. Yeah. That's that's a pretty impressive. Like, I know actors... I've, there are actors who've been working for way longer who have way less credits... Yeah, there are several years where she's got... Yeah, in 2014 alone, she did three different things. And yeah, anyway. um, I think that might be about... Right, um, fellow Dane Pilu Asbeck showed up. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, not not a huge role, but I think he did a good job. And, yeah, Vincent Reagan returns as King Atlan. 
in flashbacks and yeah you know he's it's it's he yeah, he's he's really really good at the the role um who is that i do not remember that character okay um that might be about um yeah so the dialogue there's definitely some of the dialogue is quite good it's just that there's a lot of it that's very like they do a lot of these jokes that really aren't like it's just it's the, you know these throwaway jokes these kind of nothing yeah and and there's definitely sometimes where it's just this like just really exposition heavy which yeah that's i've i've seen a number of critics you know call out specifically the the fact that it it moves at kind of a ridiculous pace and ultimately i'm not sure i would actually say that the the plot and and overall like i'm not sure it's actually any more like compared to the first one i don't I, th I think it's roughly as complicated and and like because if if you think back to that first movie you know takes us through all seven kingdoms you know there's a there's this like MacGuffin fetch quest thing and I I suppose I think it's maybe the the There's a there's there's something in this film that is supposed to connect all the different plot threads, and I'm not sure that I would necessarily say that it fails to do so, but the movie is a tad. It's there's a little bit too much going on, because what's going on is you know it's not in the first. It is fairly straightforward. Like, on the one hand, you have King Orm, who's trying to, you know, yeah, us, you know, he's trying to to get all seven or as much as he can of all seven, since some of them are extinct. Yeah, he wants to become Ocean Master, and then on the other hand, you have Arthur and Mira. And some of the times Volko and and such. And by the way, yeah, Volko is not back. They have a throwaway line explaining why. But but yeah, like essentially through both yeah, both of these stories in the first one help us learn what the the you know, yeah, learn some things about all seven kingdoms. And there is this very natural sort of, like, in order for Arthur to stop Orm, he has to get the, the Triton, he has to become the Aquaman. So, you know, his personal journey is, is you know, yeah, directly in conflict with the, the villains in order, to, so, so, yeah, it's a very, it's very logical for them to clash, where in this one... The villain's goal is something that, uh, that that Arthur doesn't want to happen, and Arthur does have, you know, it's basically, yeah, it's this thing of all these responsibilities, and he's trying, you know, he's he's not even sure if he still wants to be king, because he feels like, you know, this, this, these House Republicans, I mean, council, I don't know what, I was, you'll have to forgive, yeah. That was not a Freudian slip in the slightest. They're they're blocking everything he's trying to do, you know, 
And there is this thing... In a way, the movie kind of needs him to not act like a king all the time. Because then the movie would just be over. So they kind of have to throw some obstacles in, in his way. And it's... It's the kind of thing where you at times it feels like they really kind of wish that they were still just writing the first movie. That they were writing a movie where the protagonist did not have every single living thing in the oceans of the earth at his you know disposal. Because that's really not they they and it is you know how how do you fight something like that you know how, so so yeah. Arthur's specific goal here does not really go in in comp yeah go in opposition to the villain's plan and the villain's plan is not something that will directly affect like in the long term like down the line it affects but there's actually fairly early in this film something happens and then there's a time skip and like we're told that oh in that you know they yeah they skip ahead five months in those five months important stuff happened but we're only catching up to it to it now you know so it's been five months and only now is is Arthur and Black Manta actually going to directly deal with each other you know and that kind of does demonstrate you know there's based on the trailer I kind of thought this is a movie where like Black Manta intentionally attacks I actually don't even remember because it's not called Atlantis is it that's the entire realm not the city whatever he's going to attack the the kingdom and you know Aquaman is really going to struggle to to keep him at bay and they're going to have to find some way to to stop him and that's not quite what happens the the it really is more this thing of the thing that Black Manta is trying to do is something that Aquaman is going to have to stop but yeah a, I I think the movie would have really benefited from making the those things just slightly more like put put them on an actual like oh, what's the word um yeah um collision course you know instead of having it be that both of them are trying to do something that the other one doesn't want them to do like Black Manta would love for Aquaman to not, for, for Arthur to not be king, but he's not really doing something that will, like, because that's the thing, like, uh, ultimately you could have had, like, oh, he's trying to manipulate, but then I guess maybe they felt like that would have been too much of a repeat, because that's, you know, in the first movie, Black Manta and Orm are together manipulating the perceptions of the kings of the various parts of, of Atlantis, you know, so so yeah, maybe they felt like it would have been too much repeat, but at least it would have tied in, whereas instead, like, yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't completely work as, uh, yeah, it, it ends up not being as focused. And when you have this much plot, focus is imperative. Now, this was filmed, let's see, yeah, some of it was filmed in Hawaii, some of Malibu, and other parts of California, and some of it a place called Salt and Sands in Devon, England, and also some in London, and they get a lot of great, you know, it um, authenticity out of location shooting. You know, it's a very CGI heavy film, so it's important that there are some like physical environments. 
you know, there are times where, okay, yeah, clearly those actors are walking in sand. You know, that actor is definitely, there's, there's a, a rock right next to, you know, and that is also some, you know, like with the first one, you know, this is one of those things, you know, big blockbusters today, there's an expectation of a lot of different t locations and a lot of different, like, toys, you know, so you have to design a lot of different weapons, different in this case, creatures, sometimes it's just different designs of, of guys running around attacking, you know. And, and yeah, like, they absolutely deliver. There's some really, really interesting-looking, memorable, cool designs throughout this. And they do a good job, you know, explaining why are we visiting this many different areas and, yeah, making them interesting to, to, yeah, to watch. And, let's see, yeah, this was made on an estimated $205 million budget. And I will definitely say you can see the, the money's right there on, on the screen, for sure. And let's see. Yeah, the the action is quite good. The you know others have pointed out it doesn't have like a single really standout action scene the way that the first one had. The attack in I want to say Sicily, you know where where the camera travels around and. You know, they're fighting at the clock tower, they're fighting in the this other place, they're running across the roof and jumping, you know, all this stuff. This one doesn't have a single one that's quite like that. I wouldn't say that the action was ever just, like, boring, which it kind of sounded from other reviews that, yeah. I, I will say, you know, this is one of those things, if there's going to be that much action... It's really, really good if you can always make it have some kind of emotional impact. And that's something that, you know, the first Wonder Woman did exceptionally well. You know, the you don't have to love that movie. And, you know, but I I think it's it would be kind of silly to claim that there's a single action scene in that entire movie where there's just no emotional, you know, like maybe it doesn't work for you, but you can at least appreciate, okay, they were, they were going for this and they actually did a thing or two that was, that was pretty smart in, in how to, to accomplish what they were going for there, you know, and that's just not quite the, the case here. And... Um, yeah, the the music is quite good. I quite appreciate that they brought back at least some of the light motifs, like the the Black Manta theme. You know, yeah, it returns and it's just as epic as always. There's some really great sound design. There's you know, which is extremely important when there when there's so much CG. And yeah, some of the the like creatures you you watch, like they just they the sounds they make when they move, when they attack, when they communicate, you know, they just they have a there's a there's a quality to them where it feels like you could almost maybe not encounter it in the real world, but you can believe, okay, somewhere out there in the multiverse this thing actually exists. There's a little bit of, like, horror stuff. It never got quite as... I, I Yeah, never got quite as scary as the, the first one. I wouldn't rule out if maybe, like, the... the maybe he was, he was told by someone at the studio, listen, we got some phone calls, you're gonna have to tone down the the horror stuff. 
you know, and it's too bad, because, like, Shazam 2, I don't know if it was quite as scary as the first one, but, you know, for, for PG-13, pretty scary, you know, both Shazam movies, first Aquaman movie, not as much this one, and... Right, so, uh, right, I did not get written down exactly how long the movie itself was, but by the end of the one post credit scene, I had been in the movie theater, yeah, from, yeah, from when the movie starts to that is about an hour and 55 minutes. And I would say it felt maybe 10 to 20 minutes longer than it actually was. And... Yeah, so the best elements... The... Yeah, seeing these characters again. An epic comic book put on the silver screen. More interaction between some of these characters that... Just, yeah, they're they're very entertaining together. Like, Orm and Arthur, great together. The worst aspect is probably that the plot is just... It doesn't quite... Yeah, as I mentioned, the, the it isn't quite as focused. And... Yeah, something I saw several critics say was... Right, so, yeah... I don't think it's a huge problem, but, you know, if you thought that the first one was, like, I know some, I, I believe I recall Film Brain's review of the first one, he said that he felt it was kind of overwhelming, there was too much world building, which, you know, fair enough, I, from someone who loves comic books, I thought it was pretty much perfect world building, but yeah. You know, for sure, if if you felt that that was the case with the first one, this one's definitely going to bother you. Um, right, uh, yeah, so something I saw others say they felt it was lifeless, which I, there, there is some, some truth to that. Uh, the thing I was most worried about was the, you know, the, the sequel problem, and there was a little bit of, of that, as I've mentioned, and yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was more of the world that the first film introduces, and that was really cool, like, just some of the places that they visit here, um, yeah, without spoiling you know, obviously you see where Orm has been imprisoned, and there's very, yeah, it, it feels like a real place, and you would not want your worst enemy to be imprisoned there. You have the, this kind of seedy underground kind of place, and... This, this, like, jungle, just, yeah, some really, really cool places. The trailer does give too much away. Um, it is one of those cases where it's diff difficult to tell the audience very much without spoiling. And I will say the trailer gives you a good idea of what the movie is like. The cover and poster don't give too much away and give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. This has a 36% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I think really underlines the fact that they are like this, it's a pass-fail system. You know, I, I think if, if... If you're comparing... Yeah, on, on Metacritic, it has a 43 out of 100, which is at least slightly... Yeah, and, and you know... Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, 36%. Based on 162 reviews, 103 of them are rotten, 
average score is 4.90 out of 10. But the audience score is 79% based on over 1,000 verified ratings. The average rating was 4.1 out of 5. That feels a little high to me, but I definitely... And this is also one of those things where, like, yeah, critics are gonna, you know, poke holes like I've also done here. But people who are just going in to enjoy, you know, a couple of hours, yeah, this one is fun, you know, and it's it's important to keep in mind. I'm not one of those people who are like, ah, oh, I hate critics. But when you look at a score that's this low, keep in mind, you know, it's not that... This is 162 critics who are all saying no one should ever watch this movie. It's more that they're like, well, you know, there's this, 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 and this wrong with it. And, and yeah, that's that's how it got there. Um, yeah, the consensus, Jason Momoa remain, remains a capable and committed leading man, but even DC diehards may feel that Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom sticks to familiar waters. So yeah, on Metacritic, 43 out of 100, mixed or average, 60% mixed, uh, let's see, 20% positive and 20% negative, and there's 30 reviews total, and let's see. Yeah, one one of the people who really hated it said that you know more more of effort has been put into the CG than it has to the script. And the, one says the film never tries to do anything other than look good, and is hellishly ugly. Even so, yikes. And. One person says the franchise, the Aquaman franchise, is just flatlining. One person says the film commits a sin that is new to cinema. It's a boring James Wan movie. And one person says exactly the kind of insipid malarkey superheroes movies spent the last few decades trying to prove that they're not. Now, uh, Metacritic users have given it a 4.1 out of 10, mixed or average, 51% negative, 33% positive, 16% mixed, 29... Oh, right, ah, crap. Um, how many ratings? 88 ratings, and 29 user reviews, and... One person gave it 10 instances of pet mess on the bed out of a possible 10. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that that was not Amber, that was the pet. The dog, I think it was. I forget exactly. I try not to spend too much time thinking about that rather depressing trial. And, yeah. One of the, one of the people who hates it. Yeah, this person gave it a 1 out of 10 and just says they should have recasted you-know-who. That just shows they don't actually care what the fans want. And I already addressed that in the... Yeah, another person who says that and only that. Like, it's fine if you don't like the movie, but... Like, if you actually watch it, there's... It would... They would have to reshoot chunks of this film... To, to get Amber Heard out of there. Like, I guess maybe they could have, like, f you know, face replaced or something, but would that really have made anyone happy? Wouldn't I feel like people would still be like, well, that's clearly still Amber Heard there. Now, the, let's see. Hmm. This one person says the biggest mistake was Amber, but they did actually. This reviewer does also, you know, point to to yeah other aspects. So I really appreciate that. 
One person says it's worse than Batman v Superman. Ouch. And yeah, wow. A lot of the people who hate the movie bring up Amber Heard. So, yeah. Right, one person says the, the, some of the climax is very anticlimactic. That is definitely true. And, yes, so, on IMDb, it has a 6.0 out of 10, which I think makes a lot more sense than the other ratings, and that is because IMDb... You give it somewhere between a one and one and a ten. So, of the fourteen thousand user ratings that it has gotten, nineteen point five gave it a six, nineteen point four gave it a seven, eleven point nine gave it a ten, ten point nine gave it a one, ten point eight gave it a five, ten point five gave it an eight. 6.0 gave it a 4, 4.1 gave it a 9, 3.8 gave it 3, and 3.2 gave it 2. I wish I knew how much of the ones are just people who don't want to see Amber Heard in anything ever again, but I'm sure a lot of people watched this and legitimately thought it was a 1 out of 10. So there are currently 110 IMDb user reviews, or 88. If you hide the right on the tip of my tongue, if you hide the spoiler ones, and yeah, I read. Oh, I should have it here. The ones I read are the 75 that didn't have spoilers and were up when I read. I guess last time I read was yesterday. I didn't have time to do it today. Ten people, of, of the 110, ten gave it a one out of ten. Only two gave it two out of ten. Eight gave it three. Eleven gave it four. Twenty-six gave it five. Twenty-three gave it six. Thirteen gave it seven. Eleven gave it eight. Five gave it nine. And 16 gave it 10. So yeah, you know, some people do really love it, but there's a lot of people who really hated it. Uh, right, the, the CG is very, very good. There's a couple of things that look somewhat fake. And yeah, there's some really excellent stunt work. And I think that might just about cover it. Yeah, um, I rate this seven gaggles of seamen out of ten. And I, I think. It deserves at least slightly better than it has gotten. I'm not sure this is one that's going to be like reevaluated down the line. And yeah, so let's see. Uh, yes, my updated ranking. So. Yeah, ranking all of them worst to best. Love Shazam 2 and all I mentioned after that one. Batman v Superman, Wonder Woman 1984, Snyder Cut, 2016 Suicide Squad, 2017 Justice League, Man of Steel, Black Adam, Shazam 2, The Flash, Aquaman 2, Blue Beetle, Wonder Woman 1, Aquaman 1, Shazam 1, Birds of Prey, and 2021 Suicide Squad. And... Yeah, that brings us to the spoiler section, so there we go, and yeah, once again, from here on out, I will spoil everything, 
So please don't watch any further until you've watched the movie itself. And starting with notes taken while watching on the pad of paper. I almost got all the way through one this time even. I, yeah, took a lot of notes for this one. I like the opening logo and such being on theme. And I will say the, the opening the opening does some things that are really, really great and some things where, like, you can tell that they, you know, in part it serves as a recap. It's, it's telling, it's reminding people what happened in the movie since, you know, the first one, was it 2018 or was it 2017? I'll have it momentarily. 2018, it's been five years. You can understand, you know, not everybody rewatches it all the time like I do. They, they, you know, need to bring people back up to, to speed on what happened in the first one, as well as set up the new status quo. And there, there are definitely some really good decisions in there. I quite appreciate making it do double duty as, like, at first it's this, ah, oh, you know, it's super cool, you know, we're gonna see Aquaman in action, and then it cuts to him, like, playing with, well, acting something out for his baby, to, to make the baby, you know, really excited. And that, like, immediately, you know, points out, yeah, you know, he's, he wants to still be badass, but he does also have responsibilities now, you know. And and this thing, you know, you don't necessarily look cool while trying to take care of your, your baby, but that doesn't mean you're not going to do it. And... Let's see. I like that the seahorse whinnies. That's, yeah, pretty... I approve of that. And, and yeah, they do the thing, you know, yeah, I talk to fish, you know, he has to point out and they, you know, yeah, try to, to say, you know, but I'm still cool. And, let's see. Yeah, I, I quite like the thing, you know, so Arthur gets so into it that he, he like pushes away his, you know, Tom's chair, and he's oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Pops. And he's, whatever. I didn't need to see a Aquaman's baby was a water birth joke, but I'm not unhappy that I saw it. That was, that was legitimately a kind of cute, uh, yeah. And they do the, the pee in mouth gag, which, like, I, I'm not the first person. So I, th I think it was maybe Film Brain who, in his review, also said, you know, are we still doing jokes like that? Like, we've, we've seen that joke before. Like, there's a, there's a joke in an early episode of Charmed. So, you know, 25 years ago or something that did this exact same joke. Like, in, in that one, it didn't go into the mouth, but that was also a, a baby peeing, you know, directly towards the, the face. Of, so, yeah. And, yeah, we get the detail about, you know, being king is not fun like he hoped it would be. And I will say it was kind of, Amusing the thing. I mean, you know, he's sitting there. He's he's falling asleep. The crown is falling. You know, and Mira like nudges him away. He's like, yeah, uh huh, exactly. I'm one hundred percent. You know, and and the, like the the two, you know, debating. Look at him like, what? Like, just, that was that was. It was a very cheap joke, but it, it's I don't know. It just kind of worked for me. The Danish. 
Prime Minister did that once at like crap. What was it? I, it was it was some really important like he he didn't he didn't applaud, but he said I object. He woke up and said I object in the middle of just you know it didn't make any sense for him to be saying that. That was that was not our proudest moment as a country. Maybe that's why like I'm not even sure it has has an American. Maybe not a president, but certainly someone high up. And <laughs> Arthur manages to step out of the way of the of the pee, and then Mira uses her liquid, you know, warping abilities to make it hit his cheek and and laughs. Yeah, that's. That's a that's a that's a choice. You know, if as as a parent to a to a baby, you you find your laughs where you can. I like that when when the fridge is opened, there's literally nothing in there other than beer and baby bottles. Like that's a that's a pretty strong contrast there. And yeah, they talk about you know. Tom, he's such a grandpa. He's such a, a grandparent, at least. Maybe it's more of a grandma than grandpa thing, but very grandparent. Like, I'm not getting any younger. Like, I know you already gave me one grandchild. I'm just saying, would another one really be just complete? Oh, wait, I'm supposed to do a. I, f I forget which. I, I just watched Darkest Hour, and I, I already forgot which is the fun way and which is the boring way to do that. Anyway. The, the, yeah, you know, but they, they briefly talk about, you know, how Orm, you know, technically Arthur's brother, and, let's see, and, and I, yeah, I quite like, you know, Arthur Jr. can also talk to Fish, and the, the, yeah, you know, finally Arthur has someone to share that with. That's that is very sweet, and that is like I, I really appreciate. This is not like hopefully we are just done making those terrible, obnoxious movies where like someone who's a parent is like, you know, maybe I should just leave and leave my partner to be a single parent. Like, can we just not? Can we seriously just stop making those movies? Just so so yeah, you know, in there are times where he's worried about if he'll be a good father, but he never like just he never even considers just leaving, you know, and, and to have this thing of you know, because that is like that is the the ideal is for you to be able to share some something with your offspring that you maybe can't with others or you know for for whatever reason you know that's yeah that's i i really appreciate that that's a that's a really great uh, yeah kind of wish the rest of the movie built on it more but yeah and the ice caps melt to show the title and yeah, um, one one thing, you know, Film Brain points out in his review, which I will link in the description box, that the, um, yeah, this thing of, you know, trying to solve this massive problem, you know, in this case, uh, global warming, you know, trying to, just, yeah, making a movie where a character just, you know, gets in front of the world, on, on a microphone, on camera, and tells the world we're gonna fix this together, you know, because it's so important. Re he said it reminded him of Christopher Reeves in Superman 4, and yeah, that is, it is kind of giving that, um, that's, that's slightly unfortunate, you know, it's, because they're, clearly their heart's in the right place, you know, it's not like they're turning around saying, screw this, I'm going to Mars, I don't care what happens to the rest of y'all, no, they're they're trying to do a good thing, but yeah, it's just not the several 
people have pointed out this movie is not up to the task of addressing such a weighty issue as climate change and I feel like because the first movie probably got at least a little criticism for that I know Renegade Cut you know talked about that it's not really yeah it's it's a very sort of they're trying to be sort of apolitical or liberal kind of about it and saying you know it's not just the the yeah not not quite being willing to to be honest about who is to blame and you know this one also does some you know this this clearly it is trying to to course correct but it's just not quite yeah and let's see then we have the um, yeah we meet black mansa's new team and see his scars very nicely done very cool design there and yeah we we learn they've they're looking for atlantis tech still haven't been able to find it and he still wants Arthur dead. You know, there's that thing about every, any day, every day that I don't find Atlanta in tech is another day that Arthur Curry gets to live. You know, so that's, yeah. And, yeah, Dr. Shin gets to the place. And first they run from the ice melting and then they fall in. Very cool tentacle. And, and legitimately kind of intense and, and bordering on horror when it takes the the other guy. <laughs> and Black Man uh, is happy. Um, you know, thank God for global warming or something like that is his line. And they even have Dr. Shin, like, say, uh, I don't think we want to be saying that. Like, I, th I think that is a place where silence would have been funnier. Like... If right after he says that, and you can have with the big, you know, like the 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 obsessed eyes that that Yahya Abdul Mateen II does so well that he also does in a Candyman, you know, have him, you know, and just have Doctor Shin next to him be like, you know, maybe take a step to the side, you get a little further away. I think having him literally say, "I don't think we want to be saying that." you know, be grateful for global war. Let that felt a little like yeah. Oh, shout out to there's the, there's um there was one user reviewer, I forget where, but someone said, We get it, Hollywood, you believe in global warming. You know, he he apparently doesn't believe in it himself and it's like, wow, that's that's the problem with this movie, that it actually accepts what the vast majority of scientists on the matter agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I appreciate they make the Lost Kingdom quite creepy. And, yeah, Black Manta assembles the trident. And, yeah, the, the uh, what was the name again? Cordax starts talking to him and yeah we jump ahead five months and we're told you know global warming is worsening and there's a plague attacking Atlanteans and and yeah um, Arthur believes that it's time to go public to tell the world that Atlantis exists and the council are convinced that humans are too dangerous and that you would have to you know there was that thing there's a line about you know if oh right I think I know who Karshan Karshan is the leader of the council isn't she yeah um the yeah they believe that you know they were they were okay with Orm, you know, waging war on land. 
and yeah, you know, so the the message is communicated in the movie that some really powerful people don't listen to what regular people want. You know, Arthur is careful to say, you know, he he's not he's not just like this is what we should do. We, you know, the, if if this movie was like uber conservative and if it didn't have any left leanings at all, it would just be like, you know, this is. Uh, I'm a man, I'm a, you know, well, I guess he's not white, you know, white man, I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do, and you don't even get, I, I, you don't even deserve an explanation of this. But instead, he specifically says, there are a lot of Atlanteans who just want this, and and you're not giving it to them. I say we give it to them, and, and they refuse, you know, so that I do appreciate. And, and, yeah. Love the line, single parents are the real superheroes. Uh, seriously, so many single parents get hate where, like, a lot of single parents. They're single parents, not by choice. They wanted for, you know, two people to be raising the baby. But, you know, a lot of single moms, they're single because the man left her and the baby and there's a lot of men who don't want to enter into a relationship or at least don't want to be part of the parenting aspect with a woman who already has a baby and you know and shaming them is not going to change anything but I'll never convince a conservative that shaming someone that they don't like is not going to help matters Honestly, I think some of them do know. They just, they like shaming better than solving problems. Anyway, then we, yeah. Dr. Shin does another audio log, and it's a, it's an exposition dump. Maybe he thinks he's in a video game. This is like, you know, okay, so I know you're a player character. You're wondering, why is this place so empty? Why are there dead bodies and broken technology all over the place? Well... Over the next couple dozen audio logs, you will be able to piece it all together. And yeah, we learn you know they're gonna hit the the vault of the and I don't think I wrote down anywhere what it's called, so I'll just be calling it the the fuel. When I say fuel in this video, that's it's yeah. You know what? Maybe someone put it on Wikipedia. I'm just gonna real quick. I can imagine it is like actually something that's in the. Let's see. Oh wow. <laughs> okay then the the idea of oraculcum, which is apparently what it's called, it goes all the way back to Plato's writings. So they didn't just make this up for a comic book. This is an actual thing that people have been thinking. Yeah, it doesn't look like it has ever actually been... Oh, okay, there's actually some that was discovered. That seems like it might be Oracolcum. Yeah, anyway, um, yes. Oracolcum. The Oracolcum deposit is going to be attacked. And we, yeah, we get the thing about, you know, try to avoid confrontation. We can't fight their whole army, even with the cannon, the sonic cannon. And yeah, I, I quite appreciate. So the, you know, the little thing that picks up the presence of Manta and his his army or yeah his is the people working room it picks them up and it makes clear to the audience that it picked them up but it's not so careless that the actual yeah black manta and the others don't realize until the door has closed behind them that's when the the siren goes off the the I mean alarm siren I don't mean a siren starts singing that would have been hilarious oh my god 
they probably had to tackle James Wan on the way to set and convince him, no, the alarm for the vault cannot be a literal siren singing. That is too silly even for this movie. And, yeah, he asks for, Black Manta asks for extraction. And the border is attacked for the second film in a row and fails for the second film in a row. Just Okay, so in the first one, it wasn't technically an attack. They were sneaking past the, or, yeah. Let's see. First they sneak past and later they just fly past even though they have been discovered. You know, I'm just saying the the second Thor movie also has their their like defense yeah, the defensive shield and the the cannons for a defense they fail, but that's only one movie out of you know, they were they were careful to make it, you know, yeah, really, to all four Thor movies, someone manages to, to get into to Asgard, but, you know, it, yeah, it's different means. It's not the same, so, so yeah, I, I think that would maybe have been a good, and see, again, that's where, hypothetically, let's say that Black Manta was manipulating the council, because the we don't get anything positive about the council in the entire movie. Like I guess at the end they eventually just go along with what Arthur asks. But like you could easily have had it. I mean, yeah, there wasn't really. Did anything? Did he present new evidence? I don't. I'm not sure. I understand why they were now willing to to go along with with what he was suggesting. Because what he suggested was the same thing as what he suggested at the start of the movie. You know, so so yeah. If it turned out that the leader of the council had been corrupt, yeah, you could have them replaced by someone else, and that person goes along with Arthur. But because yeah, because yeah, if there was corruption there, that would explain you know oh the the council leader made sure that you know Black Manta would be able to to get past. And, yeah, uh, Mira is knocked out, and we have Arthur versus Black Manta, and I appreciate, so, so yeah, Black Manta says, you stole Orm's throne and his woman? Shame on you. And... Yeah, and and Black Manta, or someone he's working with, you know, make sure to derail a ship, and Arthur has to to stop that. And, and yeah, you know, we see that the, the sonic attack is actually very effective. And, you know, the sonic attack is actually very simple. What it does is it beams images of a pregnant sonic into the brains of the targets. And, yeah, it's, it's devastating. And, yeah, the, the council would, yeah, would like to, to take away all power from the the throne and I appreciate that Mira actually like she's got like burns from the blast by Black Manta and yeah they told me you know yeah so the the oracalcum you know the technology let's see to refine it I guess they they call it Let's see, I don't think they call it an oven, but it's something like, yeah, and that's destroying the environment, and that was also what was happening, you know, before the Lost Kingdom was lost, back when it was just the kingdom, and, yeah, you know, that again, like, it, it is actually, it is an extremely important message to, to 
get out there. You know, it's a, it's basically a, you know, in the movie it's auricalcum, in real life it's fossil fuels and such. I suppose maybe also, like, at the very end of the movie, they they say, you know, we, we, we can solve this together, we're going to have to, you know, Earth, te uh, land technology and Atlantis technology working together, we can get there. And it's like, I mean, there's already a lot that you can do in real life, like, about fossil fuels, at least, in, in real life. So I kind of wish that they had just talked about, you know, just bring up some of those, you know. Honestly, I would love for Aquaman to stay, Jason Momoa, perhaps playing Aquaman, stare down some a-hole saying, you know, okay, so I know that a, technically, you know, a, a, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, a wind turbine would save countless lives, but it would ruin my view. Just, yeah. And... Yeah, so Aquaman wants to break Orm out in secret, and he's going to work with Dolph Lundgren and Nicole Kidman. And they do the thing with the with the heist editing, where they go back and you know they they ex we see him in a place, and then it cuts back to them explaining. And when you get there, you have to do this, and and we meet. Topo. I'm not 100% sure why the other, like, both Arthur and Orm just hate Topo. Like, he seems like he's trying, you know, he's, he's doing the best he can. And, yeah, they, they give Orm just enough water for him to even survive. And Arthur takes out some of the guards while invisible and the yeah you know straight up the you know orm you know with with the with the facial hair and the the really ragged look you know recognizes you know the the person he's standing in front of standing in front of him and he's like it's and then the Theme song plays. Is that too vague? Do I need to? I th if you know, you know. And let's see. Yeah, pretty cool. When Orm shoots some guards, we learn he also hates Topo and. So yeah, again, this is like this is such a dumb joke, but apparently Arthur had brought water that he was intending to give Orm, but then he drank it all because it's hot up there, dude. Wow. Is ink P that is something that keeps scientists awake at night. They take a roll in the sand, quite a substantial roll. And yeah, some guards come by to attack them. And very, very cool when Orm, you know, he gets all the way to the, you know, he's crawling, gets all the way there, and, and you know, the water washes over his body. And he just jumps up, and he's, like, back to full power. That was very cool. And I appreciate, like, they set that up. You know, it wasn't a huge wait between the setup and the payoff, but it's there. It's not just, like, randomly. So, and then we have the... Yeah, they, they flee as reinforcements arrive. Have some fun as they bicker. 
yeah, and we're told, you know, oh, the, the only reason that Black Manta would be this crazy is because of the Trident. You know, characters keep saying that he's he's changed, and, you know, he used to be cool, man. And it's just like, I mean, you really didn't need this extra thing. Like, it really is just this thing of, you know, they felt that there was a need to make... I. That they felt the need to make Black Manta more powerful, so that he would be a, a threat. You know, there's a reason he wasn't the main villain of the first movie. He's just not quite strong enough to pose a significant threat on a on a long term basis. I wish that the I wish that they did away with the possession. I think that it should just be that. It's extremely powerful, and it maybe tells you where Kordax was, and Kordax promises he'll make you even more powerful if you free him. That could accomplish it, but this thing of, you know, oh, he, like he already wanted Aquaman dead. He already, you know, it doesn't really change anything, and... You know, I've seen it before, I've seen it in comic book movies, I've seen it in comic books... You know, sometimes the the people who, who you know, control where the storyline goes, they just don't quite trust that it's enough. And, you know, I, I don't mind stories where the villain is possessed. I just don't think it's super interesting if the possession, yeah, doesn't really change anything. Like, you, you know, if, if Shin got possessed... And then started behaving like Black Manta has been in both of these movies. That would be something. But this, this is nothing. And, yeah, he, Black Manta offers Shin leaving, but the jungle is a bit intense. And, yeah, the, the pirate haven. And, yeah, Ormin, Orm knew what would happen, but... You know, he knew that Arthur would not agree to it. I will never forget where I was when I saw an underwater being drink underwater. That is amazing. Like, James Wan, never change. Please, please keep making comic book movies. This is amazing. Like, how do you even come up with that? That's, that's amazing. And there's, like, a lounge singer. Like, I got a real, like, it was like Jabba's Barge or something, only I didn't want to, you know, stab my eye, my ears. You know, just, yeah. The, the, and there's, there's, they do, like, a roulette wheel, but, but it's, like, undersea theme, like, just amazing. And that's where we get Martin Short's character, um, Kingfish. Just, yeah, a ton of fun. So much, su such an enjoyable performance there. And Arthur fights some people there to stop Kingfish. And he, he puts... He puts Kingfish's head inside a bowl that currently has water in it, but he starts letting out some of the water. Cause like we've seen you know, we've seen there's a, there's a lot of scenes in movies and TV where someone tries to get information out of someone else by holding their head underwater or threatening to to dunk their head in in some dangerous liquid or something. But to do it the other way around, that's very fun. And... Right. Orm has never had a cheeseburger. Which... I mean... Tell me you're Americans making the movie without telling me you're Americans making the movie. Like, okay, I mean... Cheeseburger. I like I like cheeseburgers, but there's like there's other foods out there that are that are significantly more 
interesting, but yeah, whatever. It it kind of reminded me of, I want to say, if it, yeah, twins when they're like, oh, you know, this guy who's like vegan or something, or was it only vegetarian back then? You know, I bet he would love nuked mac and cheese, and it's like, I mean, I've I've had nuked mac and cheese, I've had vegan. I really don't agree. I, I suppose okay, vegan food from the time of that movie was not, you know, what vegan food is today. But no, like that's that's very it's it's insecurity by people who really don't want to be asked to go vegan. And I I like the line about you know your prejudice kept you from enjoying half of the world. And that's, you know, yeah, there are a lot of people who are cutting themselves off, selves off in real life from a lot of stuff that they would probably love if they just gave it a chance. So when you see the giant rat, you're already like, that's not right. That's, that's very, very wrong, and I would very much like to leave here, please. And then you see a spider eating it. And then you see another spider and another. And then there's like seven spiders. And then they all, ch you know, yeah, chase the, the two of them. And yeah, they do the, you know, true kings build bridges, which is a, a great line. And yeah, Shin assembles the, the trident and sees the same vision as Yahya Abdul Mateen the second you know so so Shin is also familiar with the the Candyman now and um Arthur Cole's Orm Loki. Does that mean that the Marvel comics and or movies exist within the Aquaman universe? Because, like, I'm, I'm not saying that that's, like, illegal. Um, Eternals made two references to DC Comics. And yes, I know DC stands for Detective, so... I just said Detective Comics Comics. I just, I, I like the idea that DC Comics is like stand-up comedians talking exclusively about comic books. I'm not saying I'm, I'm I think that it's, it's wrong to do. I'm just slightly confused. Because on the other hand, it is entirely possible that Arthur is literally talking about Norse mythology. I'm just saying... I, I kind of wish I knew exactly what the the ex, yeah exactly what the idea there was. It it feels like they just didn't completely think through. You know, cause cause like if that you know let's hypothetically say that the first X Men movie, you know, someone called Magneto Loki or something, we wouldn't necessarily be thinking comic, you know. Cause, cause he wasn't a, but like, he just had his the second season of his his spinoff show. You know, it's it's not, it's not some nothing little, yeah. And yeah, Shin tries to give himself up to Arthur and Orm, and explains. And then as a conversation is happening, there's an explosion, and then Arthur lands and he says, I hate when that happens. So I guess that's how they responded to the common criticism that, like, you know, this was something that was pointed out by, for example, um, pitch meetings, you know, every time the the... That they're a little worried that the as, you know something too much of the movie has has occurred without a, a you know something big. There's going to be an explosion, often in the middle of a line, 
and then, you know, just, yeah, it happens a lot in the first movie. I think it only happens this one time in this movie, and this, I guess, was their response. You know, like, even Arthur is fed up with that trope, so, yeah, I approve. And... Yeah, they, they defeat the tech squid by tying its laces together. That always works. Which just really makes me want to watch, you know, Empire Strikes Back. And, yeah, so Orm and Arthur fight like Manta. That was some fun stuff. I quite like, you know, I... I I hope that Yahya Abdul Mateen the second, and I also I, I really appreciate. I'm guessing his father or some you know someone looked at that name and said, you know what, that's so badass. Double up, you know, another another person with that exact name. Just add a second at the end. I hope he keeps doing stuff where he is wielding stuff that is like. Swords. I'm, you know, for some of the fight, he also just used the trident as a trident. But like when he's got a half trident in each hand, you know, similar to how in the first one he was also using swords. That was really really cool. And let's see, yeah, Anirus shows up with reinforcements. They start shooting. At the island. And yeah, Arthur is being crushed until Mira rescues him. She even gets a line not very long after. And yeah, we learn about Necrus, the black city, was a curse upon all the other kingdoms. And yeah, they talk about, you know, Black Mance is going to need blood from the the bloodline and apparently I, I don't remember for sure but I can imagine this actually like apparently Orm says he means to end the bloodline which is just like God bless Patrick Wilson he really just, just yeah fantastic yeah and and the Oh right, and we also have the the line. No one, no one hits my brother but me. Which, like, that is kind of funny when they're talking about like ending the world and and such. But but yeah, the 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 fact that you know that yeah, they realize that Arthur Jr. might, you know, yeah, that would be one way for Black Manta to get blood to to free. Cordax, uh, and three different characters say the word no right after each other. I think two would have sufficed, but I mean, I know I've been like, you know, sudden suddenly realizing, oh no, you know, this term paper, it's due really really soon and I need it's not quite long enough to pass uh, if I use the same word more times that will make it look longer and yeah Shin has now fully reached the point where he's you know yeah he's gonna do everything he can to, to help Save so he sends the the signal with the um, coordinates, and he also like puts a an explosive where the where Black Manta expects the baby to be, and you know oh how nice he he put the baby right to where it's extremely cold. Nice job, the baby's gonna be okay, but you know. It's it's Aqua Baby. It's gonna you know it has very very strong genes. It's gonna be able to yeah. It can withstand very intense circumstances like that. 
You mean to disrupt their disruption? And yeah, good fight against the the forces of Cordax. I will say the 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 part where the the you know Nero Nero Dolph Lundgren clearly does not trust. You know he's like don't don't give you know don't turn your back on this guy. And when it's time to hand out weapons, he gives him an axe, not a not a rifle. And then when he's hanging there, and and you know, the only person who who realized that Dolph Lundgren is hanging there is Orm. And we just see his face. And he pops out of frame. I just see Dolph Lundgren's face. It's like I knew it. I I knew this guy would you know. And then he pops back in with the axe and chops off the, the you know. That was a great moment. Just this thing of because because really. This is legitimately like who's gonna know? You know, if they if this thing kills Dolph Lundgren, you know, Orm could just be like, "What? I thought he was right behind us," you know, kind of thing. But no, he he really is better than you know others think. Let's see. Yeah, and you know, of course, um, it's very cheap to to like for audience sympathy to have the villain actually attack a baby. You know, it's it's pretty ridiculous, and it didn't even like. I know I wasn't personally like terrified. Of what, you know, I, I honestly, I probably wasn't. I didn't feel like there was a huge chance that something bad was going to happen. There's a lot of movies that had me like terrified of what's going to happen to that child. You know, a very recent one would be the the most recent Evil Dead, which yes, okay, that's a horror movie. That's a hard R horror movie, so it's not quite the same. You know, but the yeah, yeah, the first Shazam movie, also a PG-13, you know, recent DCU movie. That one, I was thinking, oh, you know, don't hurt the kids, and and in this one, it just yeah, I it never felt like yeah. Um, let's see, and it's also just like it's, okay, we, you know, we already you know Arthur's already the good guy. We don't need him to literally be saving a baby. To you know, right? Also, someone said you know. DCU has to stop anim animating babies because it always looks terrible. Which I don't, I don't need, I didn't really notice any bad CG on the baby in this one, but Flash definitely, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, um, Black Manta's like your blood is will do as well. And yeah. Orm is then possessed by Cardox. Cordax, that's it. Um, him too. And yeah, now they they do a, a another throwaway gag where, you know, now Black Manta isn't strong against you know, and it just yeah, I I I didn't really love that Arthur just easily gets rid of Manta like that. And I I don't know if he has been before, but Patrick Wilson being in so many James Wan movies, it really was just a matter of time for he himself ended up possessed in one of these. It's possible this isn't the first, but yeah. And Yeah, and they struggle over the the trident. Typical siblings fighting over a toy. And 
Yeah, they edited in some flashbacks. I don't think that worked just like amazingly. And um oh right, right, yeah. So um I'm going to need the name again. Cordax. Cordax manages to catch the, yeah, the, the first trident thrown, but then Arthur tosses his own, which is enough to, to kill him. And they do the, the Robin Hood thing where it splits the other one. And Black Manta would rather let himself drop than accept... Arthur, you know, yeah, helping him there, which I did think, like, I don't know if this probably was or always going to be the last time we saw Black Manta, but I do appreciate that, like, the entire reason that Black Manta was obsessed with Arthur was Arthur refused to help save his father, and he's like, I'm not making that mistake again, you know, that... Yeah, it's it's a fairly straightforward thing, you know, it's not reinventing the wheel or anything, but that felt, yeah, you know, that's character growth. Like, it's not like he's the biggest, you know, obviously, emotionally, he would prefer that Black Manta, you know, maybe he doesn't want him to die right then, maybe he wants him to suffer more, but, like, even so, reaching out and, and risking, you know, that's still a big thing. And, yeah, um, Arthur lets Orm go, and Mira even supports it, you know, one of the, one of the few lines she gets in this is, is her, you know, backing that up, and, and, you know, Orm is like, I, are you telling me I can go? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go before you change your mind, you know, just, yeah. That that was a legitimately nice, yeah, and and that's also the kind of thing where like I I wish if they had made a third Aquaman movie, I would have liked to see where exactly Orm would have ended up. That's yeah, um, and you know they do the thing which like the moment that we all knew it was going there. The moment that fairly early in the film, Orm says, do not call me brother. We know by the end he's going to call him brother. But it kind of works, you know. It's it's a, it's actually a, a kind of sweet, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and we have, you know, the, the line about, you, you know, you will ask... For help from even your worst enemy. You will reach across the aisle. And... Right, Atlantis contacts the United Nations. And... Yeah, you know, to save the world. And there's this anti-racism message about not it's, yeah we have to work together if we're gonna solve and in the ending montage you know another thing yeah real, real quick before I get yeah the very ending you know I think it would have been stronger if they just let it land instead of Arthur going like yeah or, Woo, or whatever it was he said there at the end like yeah, the DCU Aquaman goes out and you know went out and well, yeah went out as he first arrived, whooping and going yeah and such. But yeah, other than that, I I, I think it would have worked better. Although I guess maybe somewhere along the line they realized, oh my God, we're doing Quest for Peace. Okay, we got to try to distract from that. Orm finally tries a cheeseburger, and in the mid-credits scene, 
he picks up a cockroach, puts it in the burger, and appears very happy with the result. And that is that's right, yeah, I don't actually have anything in the next yeah, that's that's I uh, okay, so I'm real quick gonna see if there's anything else that I feel I want to right I, th I think it's too bad like I would have been interested in a movie that tried to reconcile the idea of Atlantis and the the yeah Atlantis and and land you know um, that was something I quite appreciated in the uh, the second Black Panther, following up on the idea of you know what happens if everyone knows about you know a place that yeah. Um, I think that is. Um, Right, right, yeah, so real quick, um, yes, the, you know, Atlanta, you know, let's see, apparently she, I think this might be f cobbled together from trailer, and anyway, something along this line is what she says in the, in the movie, the two of you standing together as brothers, promise me you will protect each other, you know, I, I really appreciate that, you know, it, it was a bit, it was a bit like, yeah, Thor 2 with, you know, the, the, I cannot believe I'm blanking on her name. I'll I'll have it momentarily. Um, Rene Russo, you know, yeah, t talking about you know I I do still care about you know, and so, right and um, yeah when when Arthur realizes that. His son can talk to the fish, you know, he's he's really happy and he has the line, I can't wait to introduce you to all the majestic creatures on our planet, show you how awesome this world can be, which, you know, dad goals, like that's, yes, 100%, that's, you know, uh, that's, that's how, again, if you, if you truly feel that way, you know, that you might actually be of a good parent and and I I love the the you know in the in the first movie we also see Arthur you know talking to the fishes and the the not not sleeping with them the yeah you know it, it means he ends up being being bullied and so for him to be like nobody's gonna bully you over this that's not gonna you know it's a it's a positive moment is is really great and let's see right uh film brain really enjoyed the the thing about you know when orm is like trying to figure out how to to run on land which he's never tried before yeah i did think there was some quite fun stuff there and, and yeah, that's it for this video, so hit me up in the comments, let me know what is your favorite movie that deals with a lot of water. It doesn't have to be underwater, it can be Waterworld, it can be Titanic, you know, but just, yeah, let me know. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. I also do a weekly episode of a horror show, which from now on is going to be Ash vs. Evil Dead. I try to do a daily video on a Marvel thing. Right now, it is What If, you know, season two of What If. As soon as that is over, I will go back to earlier Marvel TV. It's, you know, most, mostly stuff that's MCU, a little bit that's X-Men, and, and, yeah, um, the most recent thing I've reached 
is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm going to be doing Season 4. And recently we've been thoughts videos turned them out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And yeah. Um global warming should not be anyone's goal.